Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about public opinion. The material that we're going to be talking about for the next week and a half is very different from what we've been talking about before. Specifically, we're getting into an area of political science known as political behavior. This refers to public opinion, voting, elections, all the fun, sexy stuff that everybody likes to talk about. It's important to understand, though, when we talk about political behavior, this is much more scientific. This is much more of the political science part of the course. The theories and the empirical evidence that we're going to be working with are not terribly difficult to understand. In fact, hopefully a lot of it makes perfect sense when you think about it. However, it does lead us some very counterintuitive findings and ideas about public opinion. Put simply, things don't work the way most people think they do. And they certainly don't work the way most people think they should work. So keep that in mind. Um, we're going to cover, in terms of the theories, a couple of core basic concepts. Those core basic concepts are very powerful in that they help us explain a lot of the political world around us. A lot of things that are happening right now with the Republican and the Democratic National Conventions. A lot of um, things that are going to happen in the lead up to the presidential election. So. If you find yourself a little lost or confused, just go back to those core principles, and we'll cover some examples of that as we go through, but those core principles can help you answer a lot of questions. All right, well, let's dive right in. Why do we care about public opinion? A famous political scientist named V.O. Key in 1961 wrote that, quote, unless mass views have some place in the shaping of policy, all the talk about democracy is nonsense. What that means is that, <clears throat> In a democracy, the public has to have some role or some influence over the outcome of public policy. That's the essence of democracy. It's ruled by the people. So the people's voice gets reflected with the policy. And in fact, public opinion is a major driving force of policy change. It led to the abolition of slavery, the prohibition of alcohol, and then the reversal of the prohibition of alcohol. It led to suffrage for women and other minorities. And as we talked about with civil rights last week, the shaping of public opinion and the change in public opinion towards the civil rights movement, and particularly segregation, was the last major obstacle that the civil rights movement had to overcome. So the civil rights movement had to change public opinion and had to create an electoral penalty in order to end segregation in practice. So you can see that public opinion and elections are a key part of how policy changes in this country. Um, politicians, uh, especially <clears throat> those in high elected office, will not do things often because of altruistic motives. There has to be an incentive for them. And as we'll talk about when we get to Congress, the primary motivation for most politicians is re-election. So anything that threatens a re-election will cause them to act. And if it doesn't help them during re-election, then they're probably not going to take as much of an interest in it. It's just a reality of politics, as cynical as that is. So public opinion and understanding how it changes and why it changes is key to understanding a lot of the, the policy outcomes that are produced by the federal and the state governments. So let's take a quick walk through the history of the theories of public opinion. I know that doesn't sound like the most exciting topic in the world, but it actually is really interesting. First of all, let's start with the early theories. In the 1950s and 1960s, the first nationally representative samples, uh, surveys, and polls were conducted. And one of the things that the researchers wanted to know is how informed are citizens about politics. And what they found was really depressing. They found that citizens on the whole are remarkably uninformed when it comes to politics. Most of them could not even tell you what positions on issues the parties represented. So if you ask somebody which party is in favor of tax cuts, most Americans at the time could not tell you that that would be the Republican Party. And more importantly, they found that people lacked real opinions when it came to politics. This is one of the more counterintuitive uh, ideas, which is that we think, and most commentators just assume, that most Americans have positions or beliefs or opinions about most issues, and this early research found that they actually did not. If you ask somebody today, 
What's their position on a major issue? Let's say abortion. Do you favor restrictions on abortion or do you oppose them? And let's say that the person favored restrictions on abortion. You ask the person two weeks from now, and a large percentage of Americans will have changed their opinion. And in many cases, going from strong opposition to strong support. And then two weeks later, they're right back to the other side. And this early research reflected the fact that people often change their, quote, opinions on the same issue. They would say that they supported one side and then uh, shortly after they'd be on the other side. It led the researchers to suspect that people are simply making up their responses. There is no core belief underlying their responses to the poll. So if you ask somebody in a poll, do you support higher taxes or lower taxes, a large number of people will not have legitimate or real beliefs about that issue, and they'll just answer whatever's at the top of their head. They're just making it up. The research also found that only about 5% of the American public were consistently ideological. Ideology is simply uh, consistency across a lot of different issues. So conservatives tend to take the same position across you know, many, many different issues. Liberals take the other side across those. And only 5% of the public, this early research found, took these consistent issues. So not only did they change their opinion on a particular issue, but they were all over the map in terms of which issues they supported. The important thing that came out of these early theories is that it crushed the delusion of enlightened citizenry once and for all. No research since then has ever articulated or ever found evidence that a large number of Americans were politically enlightened or were highly informed. That was, that's a starting point for understanding public opinion is just how uninformed people are. Now, for about 2,000 years, Political philosophy said that an enlightened, informed citizenry that deliberated on major issues and national problems and then came to a deliberative choice during an election was necessary for democracy. So this research actually undermined something that political scholars for thousands of years had thought was essential for de uh, democratic governance. It's hard to overstate just how much of a crisis this calls for the academic community because it led people to suspect that democracy doesn't really exist, that the people are making up opinions and are choosing randomly during the elections. And moreover, it cast people as partisan robots who are being manipulated by elites. We'll talk about party identification later, but the important thing to understand about it is that party identification, this early research found, was the single best predictor of how people voted. And party identification itself, according to this early research, was simply a like of a party. It was like a football team, right? I personally, I like the Atlanta Falcons. I'm happy when they win. I'm very sad when they lose. I'm sad quite often, unfortunately. But nonetheless, party identification and politics for most people, this research found, was like that. People cheered for their team, and it wasn't really based on the policy positions of the, of the parties or the candidates. So that's the early theory theories. During the 1970s and 1980s, other scholarly research came out that began to become very critical of these early theories. We're going to talk about three of these criticisms. The first is the recognition that politics is a low priority for most people. Most people do not go around uh, like news junkies and reading the news or consuming political information. Uh, most people actually don't care about politics. It's one of the hardest things to understand is that people who are news junkies think everybody you know, is into and informed about politics the same way they are. And the fact is, that's not the reality for most Americans. The political science jargon we use is rational ignorance. I'll explain what that means. But basically, if you put yourself in the position of the average American family, the parents wake up, they have to get their children ready for school, they feed the kids breakfast, they get them on the bus, then the parents go to jobs and they work about eight hours, sometimes nine hours a day. They're not talking politics during that time. They get off work, they have to rush back to pick the kids up from school, they go to a soccer practice or a soccer game, they get home, they have to cook dinner for the kids and they have to get the kids ready for bed, they get the kids in bed, and about nine o'clock at night they sit down and they have about an hour to watch TV. Now, imagine that you've had a long day of work, you've you know, 
had a busy day, you haven't been thinking about politics much, you sit down for an hour on Sunday night and your options are Game of Thrones or the Republican presidential debate or the Democratic presidential debate, it doesn't matter. Now I'll tell you a confession, a little secret about myself. I study this for a living. Paying attention to politics is part of my job description and it's something that I'm fascinated by. And given that choice on Sunday, I'm going to Westeros. So I'm getting me some Jon Snow and some Tyrion Lannister on Sunday night. So even me, who does this for a living, that's an easy choice for me. Imagine people who don't care about politics, they're flipping the channel to something that's a lot more entertaining than a political debate. So that's the first criticism, that all of the political philosophy, all of the academic scholarship for those thousands of years that said that citizens have to be enlightened and politically informed, that it was just a unreasonably high expectation for average Americans. So hopefully you understand what we mean now by rational ignorance. It actually would not make a lot of sense for the average person who doesn't care about politics to sit down and spend the time and energy to consume political information or pay a lot of attention to the news. They just don't have time for that in their daily lives and they don't care about it anyway. So the second criticism has to do with the political climate in the 60s and the 70s. In particular, there's a very rapid cultural change that occurred between the 1950s to the 1970s. And you had issues arise such as the Vietnam War, the protests surrounding that. You had issues concerning drug use, marijuana. You had the bane of Eric Cartman's life, the hippies come along. You had all of this cultural change happening very rapidly and what the criticism of these early theories said was that that compares to the 1950s when those studies were conducted that was relatively politically calm. When the political environment changed, then people, the public started to change their political behavior as well. So to give you a sense of how quick the political culture changed, in a single decade, America went from Leave it to Beaver to Black Sabbath. In a single decade, America went from Leave it to Beaver being the number one show on television to Black Sabbath playing the tritone on the radio. You can well imagine that today a game, a TV show like Game of Thrones would not have been allowed to be aired in the 1950s. So it just gives you a sense of how quickly the political environment or the political climate changed. So again, just to recap, 1950s were a period of ideological calm. You had the what were called the Me Too Republicans. Basically, after the New Deal, the public became very favorable to policies such as social security and welfare. And at the time, the Republicans stopped challenging those politics. And so Democratic presidential candidate, for instance, might say, I support the New Deal. And the Republicans would say, yeah, me too. In the 1960s and 70s, as we talked about, you had civil rights, Vietnam, social issues related to abortion, drugs, the environment, and again, Eric Cartman's uh, mortal enemies, the hippies. And the result was, according to research, more ideological voters, voters that became more consistent because the parties became more consistent. The parties began taking uh, consistent positions across a lot of issues and the voters followed that and began to sort themselves out ideologically as well. The third criticism has to do with changing assumptions. In particular, it changed the assumptions of the academic community about what opinions require. Opinion does not require consistency, actually. In fact, it would be very weird if somebody had the same issue on the same, uh, or the same position on the same issue throughout their entire life. That means people are, are unthinking robots. And so changing one's opinion, the academic community began to realize, oh, that could actually be a sign that people are paying attention and following real events. Um, that they're following the political situation. Opinions also don't have to require stability. And people don't have to be stable across issues or even on the same issue over time in order to have something that approaches a real belief or a real opinion. So think about ideology. What ideological god came along and said, "Thou, if thou opposes abortion, thou must also support tax cuts. Why are those two things logically connected? In reality, they're not. They're connected only because politicians have taken those sides of the issue and people who align with one party or the other follow that position. 
So it still does notice that this still does not cast voters as philosophers or enlightened in any way, but it does mean that at the core people at least pay attention and they look to political elites and elected officials for cues about what positions they should take. So all of this to say that an opinion does not require ideological sophistication. That was one of the unreasonable assumptions that was part of our the classic conceptions of democracy before this early research in the 1950s and 1960s. So this caused the academic community to rethink the entire concept of what an opinion is. Notice now that opinion is in quotation marks. That's very intentional. We're going to talk about why that is in a second. About 1990, political science theories of voting behavior began to shift very rapidly and began to, before 1993, Specifically, you had a situation where the research was all over the map. Some people looked at information processing, some people looked at opinion formation, some people looked at voting behavior. There's no unifying theory that brought all of the knowledge that we have about public opinion together. In 1992, a man, by, a political scientist by the name of John Zoller wrote a very famous book, and in this book he offered a unified theory of public opinion. This is the most influential theory in public opinion research, uh, precisely because it brought together a lot of what we knew. We're going to, in this lecture, cover a couple of parts of his theory, and in another lecture we're going to delve into his theory very specifically and how people form their, quote, opinions. But the fundamental point here, uh, according to John Zoller, is that opinions do not exist, at least not the way we think about opinions. What he said is that most people are not thinking about politics most of the time. An opinion is not a position or a belief on an issue. Again, let's use an example of an average person. Suppose that somebody's walking across Prexy's pasture. They're probably not sitting there thinking, hmm, you know, while I don't really like the concept of abortion, there is a penumbra of privacy embedded in the 14th Amendment that does give women the right to consult with the doctor. People don't think like that, okay? That's not what somebody's thinking. That's not what's going through somebody's head when they're walking across Brexy's pasture. They're probably thinking, huh, should I do panda or pita? Hmm. Panda's yummy. I do love me some orange chicken, but, you know, pita's more healthy. Uh, that's probably what they're thinking about. In opinion instead is a sample of considerations. The major point is that John Zoller defined opinions as a sample of considerations, not a stable position on an issue. Considerations are simply things that are bouncing around your head. You might have seen a portion of the Republican um, presidential convention. You might have heard a speech, say, from Chris Christie, and that's something that sort of stuck with you is bouncing around your head. You might you know, considerations can be anything from party identification to religion to race or experiences. So you might consider yourself a Republican, and that's something that's bouncing around your head. Basically, a consideration is anything that helps a person respond to an issue. If an opinion is a sample of considerations, then how do people sample it? What it means is that there's a bunch of stuff bouncing around people's heads. Not a lot of stuff, by the way. People still don't have a lot of information about politics, so they're only going to have a few considerations at the top of their head at any given moment. Which considerations are more, most important? There are two main points here. The first, which ones matter the most? The considerations that matter the most are the most salient, the things that are most important to that person. And the second are the most recent, things that you just heard within the last day or two are going to have much more importance and more likely to be at the top of your head than something that you saw five years ago. Hopefully that just makes sense, all right? The things that are going to shape people's sample of considerations the most are the things that are most important to them and the things they just recently heard. The second main point is that when you change the considerations that are at the top of people's heads, you change their responses to the issue. So John Zoller's theory doesn't make assumptions about the fact that people change their opinions. He actually helps explain why those opinions bounce around so much from one week to the next. His answer is that the considerations have changed. People saw something more recently that altered that sample of considerations that just changed the composition of the things bouncing around people's head and therefore their responses naturally are going to be different. What that means is that polls or surveys simply measure the considerations at that moment. Citizens are not, according to John Zoller's research, stupid or capricious. 
right? They're not ignoramuses that are running around just making stuff up. John Zoller's theory explains why public opinion changes over time, why individuals change uh, over time. It's because the sample of considerations floating around their heads has changed. They saw something or read something that, you know, entered their head recently and their response changed in accordance to that. And most importantly, <clears throat> John Zoller's theory is what he calls elite-driven democracy. What that means is that elites make arguments. Elites simply means people in the media, candidates, elected officials, all of the people who you see on, in the news. Those are the elites. They make arguments, persuasive arguments, for or against an issue. People receive those arguments, uh, and some of them become considerations in their head, and those considerations shape how they react to surveys. So when the nature of elite discourse changes, when the parties start taking different positions, then the public is going to change. When the parties take different positions on a particular issue, the public is going to sort itself accordingly. So that's what we mean by elite-driven democracy. So let's talk about an example. Let's go to, back to the uh, administration of President Bush and talk about his approval ratings. What we mean by approval ra ratings are a lot of polling firms will ask people, do you approve or disapprove of the job that the president's doing? And people can say, yes, they approve, or no, they disapprove. In July 19th, 2001, just a few months after President Bush took office, he had about a 52% approval rating. That's not bad for a new president who uh, had been elected in a very closely contested presidential election. So pretty good approval ratings. But September 21st, 2001, his approval rating was 90%. Now take a minute and ask yourself, why would nearly 40% of the public go from disapproving of the president to approving of him over the course of just a few months? Hopefully the answer is obvious. It was September 11th happened. There are the horrific attacks in New York City. You can see the picture on the right with President Bush uh, has his arm around a uh, fireman speaking to firefighters and first responders to the tragedy. He's using a bullhorn. This was a powerful moment. Again, whether you, uh, whatever your personal beliefs about President Bush, this was a scene that demonstrated strong leadership in the aftermath of the attacks. And what he said to these firefighters, he, he was standing on the rubble from ground zero, and he basically said, uh, he asked the people if they could hear him. And the people said, yeah. And so he was speaking through a bullhorn. He said, uh, well, I can hear you too. And pretty soon the people who knocked down these buildings are going to hear from all of us. And so again, strong leadership uh, at the time, that changed people's perspective and his approval rating spiked up to 90% among the highest in the history of public opinion polling. Let's take another example. Some pollsters have asked about Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. We talked about the details of that policy in a previous lecture on federalism. But as you may know, Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are simply two different terms for the same policy. And yet, when you ask people, you know, do you support Obamacare, they give very different reactions than if you ask, do you, afford the, uh, do you support the Affordable Care Act? Pay attention to the last bar, this one down here. The people who say don't know, not sure about whether they support or oppose the health care policy, when you ask it as Obamacare, it's only 12%. When you ask it as the Affordable Care Act, it's actually 30%. Now, what's the difference there? It's because when you ask Obamacare, you're attaching President Obama's name to the health care uh, law, and President Obama at the time of the survey was not very popular. His uh, approval rating was down in the low 40% range. People's opposition to the law increases slightly uh, when you ask about Obamacare, when you attach his name to it, then people who are Republican and Democrats can align their, uh, quote, opinions or their responses to the survey uh, accordingly. They know that Obamacare was proposed by the president, and so Democrats will support it. Republicans know that they don't like Obama, and so they oppose it. When you ask about the Affordable Care Act, a third of Americans don't have the background or the knowledge to understand that is President Obama's signature health care reform, and so you get fewer responses and less of this polarization. So finally, John Zoller's theory also explains this notion of question wording. When you ask questions differently, you often get very different reactions from the public. 
is because the wording emphasizes different considerations. And when you change people's considerations, you get different responses. So if you remind them about a policy that was promoted or supported by President Obama, their attitudes about Obama becomes a consideration and is reflected in their answers. If you ask it without that, then they don't have that queuing information and they give different responses because they have a different set of commu uh, considerations. So again, we already talked about this, but just to highlight it, when you ask about Obamacare in, the, in a survey or a poll, Obama becomes a consideration and people's likes or dislikes of him are reflected in their attitude about the policy. When you don't, it's harder for people to choose without that partisan cue. So we're going to take a brief interlude, watch a video. The video is rather short, just a couple of minutes long, but I think it's going to illustrate John Zoller's theory in all of its gory details. Be mindful of John Zoller's theory and watch as you can literally see people trying to grab things off the top of their head when they give a response and sort of struggling to think of reasons or responses to the question that Jimmy Kimmel is asking. These government shutdowns have happened before. You know, the last one was in 1996, but the debate on this one is particularly heated because people have such strong opinions about Obamacare. Interestingly, the polls show that most Americans say they don't like Obamacare, but they love what's in it when it all gets broken down. It's like, it's like the opposite of a McNugget. <laughs> so, it's interesting. And when there are complicated issues to study, most people just side with whoever they usually side with. So I decided to conduct an experiment today. We sent a camera crew out on the Hollywood Boulevard to ask people which they thought was better, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Now, as you may know, Obamacare is just the nickname for the Affordable Care Act. They're the same thing. But lo and behold, we found people who did not know that, and that didn't stop them from weighing in on it. Uh, we're talking about health care today. And which plan do you support, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? The Affordable Care Act. And what is it about Obamacare that you do not like? Um, I just think that there's a lot of holes in it, and it needs to be revamped. I think it's and you think hasn't the affordable, been cut out. You think the Affordable Care Act is a better plan than Obamacare? Better, but I'm not happy with that either. What do you agree with, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? Uh, I'm more sure towards the Affordable Care Act, um, but I'm, all, I'm also there very sympathetic for people that don't have the ability to uh, have proper medical insurance. So the Affordable Health Care Act is still a better option than yes. Obamacare? Yes. And why do you not agree with the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think it's, it, it's more, it's, it's not really available for, for all. So the Affordable Care Act is more affordable than Obamacare? It, just the name says it all. Right. Do you agree with the Affordable Care Act? Absolutely. I, you know, I think it's nice that everyone can afford it, and everyone should be able to afford it, but to force people to pay something and doctors to make something limiting their ability to do their job, that's kind of anti-American. Right. So Obamacare is un-American? I think it's kind of un-American to force people. What if they can't afford it? What if they want more coverage? And the Affordable Care Act is American. I think it's more American because it allows people to make their own choices on what they want and who they want to work with. Do you agree with the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? The Affordable. And why do you prefer the Affordable Care Act over Obamacare? I just don't agree with the whole Obamacare policy thing that's going on. I just don't agree with it. And do you believe that an informed citizenry is essential to a democracy? Yes. So you disagree with Obamacare? Yes, I do. Do you think insurance companies should be able to exclude people with pre-existing conditions? No. Do you agree that young people should be able to stay on their parents' plans until they are 26? They should be able to, yes. Do you agree that companies with 50 or more employees should provide health care? I do. And so by that logic, you would be for the Affordable Care Act? Yes. What plan do you support, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? The Affordable Care Act. And why do you support that over Obamacare? I do not like Obamacare. I don't like anything that has to be forced for everybody to buy. This is not good. Do you think Obamacare is socialist? Yes, I do. Do you think the Affordable Care Act is socialist? No. Do you believe that Obamacare will eventually lead to gun prohibition? Yes. Do you know that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are the same thing? No, they're not. <laughs> Thanks, you made me look stupid. <laughs> That's what we do. Okay, you did good. <laughs>
Now, obviously, Jimmy Kimmel selected the most hilarious responses. And the point isn't that this is how all Americans would react to a question like that. There are actually about 25 or 30 percent of the public that is very highly informed about politics. But there are also another 20 or 30 percent of the public that are like this, that think so little about politics that they would struggle to give an answer to a simple question or would not even know that Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act are two words for the same thing. So if you actually didn't realize that yourself before this lecture, then don't worry, you're in good company. Uh, it just means that you're normal. It doesn't mean that, you know, it just means that you're like most Americans, just a normal person who doesn't pay a lot of attention to politics. And finally, if this theory of public opinion hasn't scared the bejesus out of you already about American democracy, then, well, just wait until the next public opinion lecture where we dive into some of this a little more deep, uh, a little deeper, a little more deeply. So let's wrap it up with one last discussion on socialization. We talked about considerations. We talked about party identification and some of the core things that shape people's opinions, quote, opinions on issues. So where do they come from? Where did you get your political views from originally? Why, if you consider yourself a Republican or a Democrat, why are you a Republican or a Democrat? Why do you consider yourself that? Most people think that it's a, that it came about as a process of deep deliberation and paying attention to politics and just after careful thinking, choosing one side or the other. And that may be true for you personally, but for most Americans, that's actually not how it works. Um, here's an example. I was at home a couple of years ago uh, visiting family during Christmas, and I was sitting on the couch. And my four-year-old niece was sitting beside me, and President Obama uh, began speaking on the television. And I kind of nudged her. I said, hey, Lauren, what do you think about the president? And she looked over at me and without hesitating said, he's a poopy head. Now, she's four years old. All right? She did not, she was not sitting there thinking, well, you know, I don't, really care for his big liberal government agenda, and I oppose Obamacare because it's an infringement upon individual rights. I think his foreign policy is weak. Ergo, he's a poopy head. Why do you think she had such a strong opinion about the president? It's probably because her parents were Republican, and she knew that mommy and daddy didn't like the president, and therefore she didn't like it. Which is to say, that your party identification for most people develops in childhood. It's not a matter of deep, reflective thought about the substance of politics. In fact, most people develop very strong party identification around the time that they're 12 or 15 years old. That's well before people have the knowledge or the experience to form enlightened opinions about issues, which we just said most, uh, most people never do form you know, enlightened or deeply well thought out opinions on most issues. So when we talk about socialization, we're simply talking about the process of forming your beliefs, where your beliefs come from. And there are four agents or four, you know, sources of socialization that we're going to talk about. As the poopy head Obama example illustrates, the first and most important is actually the family. The second is social groups, your group of friends, your personal network uh, of acquaintances that you have, especially during your younger years. Uh, education, <clears throat> as you go through school, that's an agent of socialization. And finally, the political environment itself. What's going on in politics when people first start becoming aware uh, of politics and began, begin to pay some attention to it to the extent that Americans pay any attention at all. So let's talk about the family. Family mostly socializes people into their party identification. Party identification is one of the strongest attitudes that people have. And for most people, about 90 or 95 percent of the American public, they simply adopt the party identification of their parents or their immediate family, and they stick with that party identification throughout their entire life. Party identification, like religion, rarely changes throughout somebody's life. Family does not strongly socialize political issues. So even though a person uh, from a family of Democrats will become Democrat and typically consider themselves a Democrat throughout their entire life, that doesn't mean that they necessarily adopt the issue positions of their parents. Again, this should make sense if you go back to Zoller's theory because 
most people don't have strong opinions. They'll like a party or not, but they don't have strong opinions on issues. And so parents, there's nothing for parents to socialize children into. If the parents don't have strong opinions on an issue, then their children are not either. Now, there's a story in political lore. I don't know if it's correct or not. I don't know if this actually happened, but it's a good story, so I'll tell it. And it illustrates this idea of party identification. And the story goes that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, was campaigning. And on the campaign trail, he was speaking to a crowd, and he asked if they'd vote for him. And one gentleman said no. And Roosevelt asked him, well, why not? And the man said, because I'm a Republican. And Roosevelt said, well, why are you a Republican? He said, because my daddy was a Republican, and my granddaddy was a Republican, and my great-granddaddy was a Republican. That's why I'm a Republican. And President Roosevelt supposedly asked this man, well, what if your daddy were a Democrat, and your great-granddaddy were a Democrat, and your great-great-granddaddy were a Democrat? What would you be? And the man's response was, why, sir, I'd be a damn fool. So the second agent of socialization has to do with social groups. The social groups we're mainly talking about have to do with race, religion, gender, military, uh, so forth. Just basically, they reflect the shared experiences and perspectives that people have. This is very related to the family as an agent of socialization because people grow up, tend to grow up around others like themselves. You very rarely find a very poor family living in a shack right next to a very rich family living in a mansion. Neighborhoods have a certain amount of homogeneity to them and so the people in the neighborhoods and the people that are friends and acquaintances tend to share the same experiences and perspectives and those experiences and perspectives are what get socialized to young people. Third, we'll talk about education. Now, this is not, this actually does not work the way a lot of people think it does. Uh, especially at college, there seems to be a myth that, you know, somebody will enter college as conservative and leave as a flaming liberal. And that rarely actually happens. What education, especially high school and college, does is socializes people into a common set of values, mainly support for democracy and understanding what democracy is. It doesn't mean that uh, education actually has a very weak effect on changing people's policy attitudes because, again, I hate to keep going back to this point, but it is the most fundamental point in understanding public opinion. Most people don't have issues on those or don't have opinions on those issues. And so if somebody comes in without a strong set of political beliefs and they don't pay a lot of attention to politics and politics doesn't take place, uh, discussion of politics doesn't happen a lot in the classroom, then there's really nothing that's going to change throughout somebody's education regarding their specific uh, positions on issues. But what does change is more tolerance of minorities and uh, support for democracy. That is a major effect or a major way that education socializes people through their early years. The other major effect has to do on participation. Higher, people with higher levels of education do tend to participate in politics a lot more. They tend to write letters to members of Congress. They especially are more likely to vote. Um, they're more likely to engage in the political realm. Education also has a very powerful impact on participation and also on general support for the political system, especially democracy. And finally, the political environment itself. When people reach the age of around 16 to 18 years old, they start noticing a lot more things about politics, more than they did when they were eight years old, right? You don't find many eight-year-olds who are um, sitting down and watching a Republican or a Democratic presidential debate. They're probably outside in the river playing with frogs. That's to say that it's not until they become close to voting age that they'll start paying some attention to it, again, to the extent that Americans pay any attention to politics. Major events do have an effect, especially on young people. Young people are more susceptible to changing their political views, especially party identification. That doesn't mean they're likely to change. It just means they're more likely to change. Um, and so these can influence people. For example, somebody who came of age uh, 16, 18 years old in the late 1970s and early 1980s. They were socialized into a very pro-Republican environment, largely because of the economy. In 1980, the economy was in the tank, and the Democrats were in office. And voters blamed the Democrats for the economic stagnation, for the high inflation, and the other problems going on with the economy. 
President Reagan was elected in 1980, and three years later, the economy was booming. So the political environment was a lot more favorable to Republicans at the time. And what that meant is that young people, especially who may have been socialized in a Democratic household, some of them actually became independent or even Republican. Not a lot. You know, maybe at most 20, maybe 25 percent of people shifted in that direction who were raised in Democratic households. But nonetheless, it was a sizable shift, and you saw more people identifying as Republicans during the, uh, especially in the middle and later years of the Reagan administration. And it was the same for the for young people after the Great Recession, the ma uh, the most recent recession that occurred, two thousand eight, and again this socialized young people into a pro democratic environment, where while the economy uh, the recovery has not been great. It at least has been a recovery, and young people have slightly shifted towards identifying with Democrats, especially those who came from you know, more Republican households. So some other examples of major events that can shape uh, young, the views of young people or socialized young people, uh, especially regarding party identification. 9-11 had a powerful influence on young people's thinking about foreign policy. The Vietnam War, uh, Nixon scandals, and the Great Depression. The Great Depression especially really changed public opinion. We don't have polls going back to that time, but we can look at changes in voting uh, behavior in elections, and it had a powerful influence in socializing people into uh, democratic identification. So that's the first lecture on public opinion. Again, the next lecture we're going to delve into some of these core concepts uh, more deeply, go through a couple of more examples, and we're going to talk about John Zoller's theory uh, <clears throat> in a lot more detail than we do now. 